Good morning. Welcome to Good Shepherd Lutheran Church this morning. Uh, it's great to be here with all of you as we get a chance to gather around God's Word together. Uh, also great to uh, be here while others are viewing us online. Also thankful to have that capability and to get the chance to, to be here with us today. We are in Holy Week officially now. Uh, it's Palm Sunday. We're, we're looking ahead to Jesus as he makes his way into Jerusalem and eventually to the cross to pay for our sins and then to the tomb and back again. Uh, so a lot goes on in a week. Uh, but in our service today, we're, we're finishing our series called Our Greatest Needs. And we're thinking today about the need we have for a greater type of king, not, not a political ruler in this world. Uh, who our, our political rulers in this world, we're, we're thankful, but we need something bigger than that. And that's what God came to give us in Jesus, the great king. Um, and he's the one that we're going to celebrate especially today on Palm Sunday, when we think about what that means, that Jesus entered Jerusalem uh, and people lifted up palm branches and praised him as he came in. We'll think about what that means, especially as we celebrate him as our true king. And to start our service today, we have our children from grade four are going to be starting our service today with the song we're leading the way. And uh, so we'll let them begin. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, during the weeks of Lent, we have been preparing to commemorate our Lord's suffering, death, and resurrection. Today we come together to begin the solemn journey of Holy Week. Christ entered in triumph into his own city to complete his work as our Savior and to gain for us the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. We follow him in faith and praise him with joy. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And we'll remain standing for our opening hymn.
If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. We praise you, O God, for the great acts of love by which you have redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ. As he was acclaimed by those who scattered their garments and branches of palms in his path, so may we always hail him as our King and follow him with perfect confidence, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And you may be seated. Our God speaks to us in his word this morning, first of all, from the book of the Old Testament prophet Zechariah, chapter 9. And here we see the, the prophecy that Jesus fulfilled on Palm Sunday. Uh, specifically, that the king would come into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. Uh, but it's not just that. Uh, they also mention here, or Zechariah, the Holy Spirit speaking through Zechariah here, mentions how this, came, this king came to bring peace. But it wasn't political peace or a temporary ceasefire. He came to bring peace between us and God by winning us our forgiveness. Uh, so we read this prophecy from Zechariah 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you. Righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. The word of the Lord. And then our God also speaks to us from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 2. And here we see more about Jesus and how 
he came in humility, how Jesus is, he's true man, and he's true God. And he could have come in uh, for his whole ministry, but also on Palm Sunday, you know, with guns blazing, so to speak, but not guns, but the power of God, uh, the power of the Almighty. But instead, he came as a servant. He came humbly and gently, and he came, as we know, he came to face death. He, he, he didn't turn away even from death on a cross, one of the most shameful kind of ways to suffer and die imaginable, but he did it for us. And because of that, we know he's glorified and that he wants all people to praise him as their king. So we read from Philippians 2. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. And please stand for the gospel. And the gospel for today is from the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 21, the account of Jesus entering uh, Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday, and this will also serve as the basis for the sermon today. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. And you may be seated for the next hymn.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, there are some people who just seem to understand how to make an entrance. Uh, I think about uh, something that I never watch and I'm not even that interested in, uh, but boxing. I can just picture when boxers sort of go into the ring because they make this kind of big deal of it, right? They're, you know, maybe they have this robe, you know, that kind of looks flashy and they usually have this kind of entourage of people with them and, you know, it's kind of intimidating and you would think I would not want to have to be in a ring, you know, with this person by the time you see him walk in. Or we think of uh, maybe entertainers who, who make an entrance. Uh, I know I, I was at a, a concert once where the singer, to get out on stage, the singer didn't just walk out on the stage. The singer came flying up out from underneath the stage and then landed on it and, and started the concert. Um, it's an entrance, you know, and it, it sort of it gets you excited for, okay, you know, the show's starting now. Uh, and then sometimes people can just make an entrance just by doing something weird, I suppose, and and drawing attention to themselves. Uh, When I searched up making an entrance, the second picture that came up in my search was this. I don't know what's going on here, but people acting like this, it gets your attention, right? And so there's different ways that that people use to to make an entrance and, and get people's attention. And today we think about, well, what about Jesus? Because today, more so than I think any other time in his, his earthly ministry, Jesus really made an entrance, right? Jesus entered the city of Jerusalem. Uh, he's riding on a donkey, which is you know, about the only time we, we hear of that happening. Uh, he's got crowds cheering for him and, and groups sort of following him down the path. Uh, they're cheering. They, there's the palm branches like the, the kids had this morning. Uh, they're laying their coats in front of them. They're laying the palm branches down. They're kind of making not a red carpet, but a different kind of carpet uh, for the king. And we think, what a sight this was. And one thing that I want to kind of impress on us this morning is that this was no accident, right? Jesus knew exactly what he was doing, and he knew that he was going to make an entrance into Jerusalem on this day. Because a lot was about to happen. We know that within a week from this day, that first holy week, just a few days later, Jesus would be arrested, and he'd be tortured, and he'd be executed. And then, a week from this day, he would rise from the dead. And all the while, Jesus made sure that He wasn't going to be sneaking into Jerusalem with with no one realizing it. He made sure everyone knew that he was coming in, and by the way he entered, they knew exactly who he was. And that's what we're going to get to think about this morning. In fact, we, we, we heard it at the end of our text where some people asked, who is this? You know, the, the people who didn't already know, they just sort of had to ask, you know, who is this guy that everyone is rejoicing over? Uh, And so we're going to think about that today and think about how Jesus shows us who he is and what that means for us, not only for this holy week, uh, but for all eternity, uh, that good news of our Savior. So as we think about this, uh, and we think about the attention uh, that Jesus sort of drew to himself and this grand entrance that he he made, um, we realize it's not something that kind of normally, at least, that happens by accident. And that's definitely the case with Jesus because things had, had sort of been ramping up with Jesus. Uh, the people, of course, always wanted to be by him, to hear his teaching, to see his miracles. And, you know, his, the, the, his enemies, we think of the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, the chief priests, the people who were jealous of him, they were getting more and more angry. And things really ramped up after what we talked about last week. So last week, uh, if you remember, we talked about how Jesus raised someone from the dead. He raised someone named Lazarus, and that was very public. Lots of people were there. Lots of people knew that Lazarus had been buried four days before, and they saw the guy come out of the grave wearing the grave clothes and everything, and it it was a sight. And 
word got out. And those enemies of Jesus, they just, rather than seeing that as something like, oh, hey, maybe this guy's for real, they doubled down on hating Jesus. And they're planning, they were planning very seriously, we got to get rid of this guy. And we know that their plans, you know, worked out just a couple of days from this. But the people were that much more, you know, buzzing about, you know, is he going to come to the festival for the Passover? Because it was coming up. Uh, and then the night before, or the day before, rather, the day before Jesus entered Jerusalem, we're told in the Gospel of John that Jesus had another dinner party in the, the, the village of Bethany, very close to Jerusalem, where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus lived. He went there again, and people heard about it, and they realized that Jesus is there with the guy that he rose from the dead, that he raised from the dead, Lazarus. And so we hear, this is from the Gospel of John, we hear that a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So there's that big miracle, and then, you know, the day before, he's going to Jerusalem, people are showing up almost, you know, paparazzi style, uh, just to get a glimpse of Jesus and Lazarus is there, you know, and I would love to hear the conversations at that dinner, by the way. Um, you know, what did Lazarus say? I, you know, I don't know, but, but he was there, uh, and Jesus was there, and the people were, now they were really fired up, you know, is he going to come to Jerusalem for the big Passover festival that's coming up? Of course, we know the answer. Of course he was. And especially because he was determined to not, to not do what he had sometimes done in his ministry. There were times where he went up to Jerusalem and he kind of snuck up there and then would, would, would teach the people. Uh, and there were lots of times in his ministry where Jesus would, he would kind of, he would do a miracle and then he would tell people, don't tell anyone. And he would kind of limit the impact. You know, he didn't want it to get out too quickly. Sometimes he would even say, it's not my time yet. But now, we're at the point where it's his time, where he's going to let everybody know exactly who he is, and of course, it's all going to lead up to his suffering and his death, his resurrection, but the time was here, and that's where we see our text picking up. So as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. So we hear about this, and maybe our first thought goes to how kind of amazing it is that Jesus knew a donkey would be tied up, you know, at a certain place in a village that they weren't, they weren't at yet. And, and we're not told, you know, I suppose it's possible that Jesus had, you know, talked to someone beforehand and knew this, but this is probably a, a miracle of Jesus by the fact that he's God and knows everything, knew that the donkey would be there. But, but that's not really the most amazing part of this. Again, the most amazing part is Jesus knows exactly what he's doing, and he's setting things up for maximum impact once he enters the city. Because realize, uh, Bethphage, which is, you know, isn't a name we hear about a lot, this is a village very close to Jerusalem, and it says it's on the Mount of Olives, which is kind of, it's like this sort of the home stretch, you know, right before you get into the city of Jerusalem. So this is kind of the beginning of this, like I said, home stretch to get there that he would be riding the donkey on. And so maybe it's obvious, but just to mention, it's not like Jesus was tired and he really needed the donkey because it's, it's a long walk or something. He wanted the donkey specifically for this ride. Um, and, and, you know, we're going to talk about the prophecy about it. But again, it was part of people need to see me on this donkey. And, and an, a, one reason why, it seems like, if you look in the Old Testament, uh, we don't ever hear about donkeys being ridden by kings, but there is actually talk of, of kings riding a mule, uh, of all things. Uh, in, in the book of First Kings, King David is very old, and he knows he wants his son Solomon uh, to be king after him, and so he wants to make it public, and so he has Solomon ride on his father, King David's mule, and while he's riding on the mule, the people are blowing a horn and they're proclaiming him king uh, there in 1 Kings chapter 1. And so, you know, it seems to sometimes at least have been kind of a 
almost inauguration sort of ride that someone would ride some, some type of, you know, horse-like creature um, and, and be proclaimed king. So that very much fit, you know, what Jesus was going to do. Plus the fact that Jesus knew that the prophets had spoken about this exact thing. And right, we already read that section from, from Zechariah, but, you know, here's it's, you know, being referred to again. This p- took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So again, this is right out of the Old Testament. Zechariah, even though he had been around hundreds of years before Jesus, he looked ahead to what Jesus would do, and so Jesus was going to follow that and realize Jesus knew that the people would get this, right? Jesus knew that people knew their Old Testament. You know, they, they studied this, and they knew that the coming Savior would do this, so they were not going to miss this picture. They wouldn't say, oh, that's weird. He doesn't usually ride a donkey, huh? No, they would get it like, whoa, wait a minute. Jesus is practically proclaiming himself to be the king here just like it had been prophesied. You know, this wasn't going to, you know, sneak its way past them. He was making it very obvious. Whereas a lot of other times, it would just be sort of whispered about, you know, could this be the guy? Could Jesus be the one? And no one was really sure, and no one wanted to say it out loud kind of thing. But now Jesus was setting up the situation so that they would almost have to say it out loud because it was going to be so obvious and kind of right there in everyone's face that Jesus was the guy. Sorry, the disciples, and so we see that they carry this out. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed him. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. And a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. So now we see everything is in place. He's entering Jerusalem. He's, he's riding the donkey, just according to the prophecy. And the crowds were there. Because, like I kind of alluded to, this was also the Passover festival. And back then, when when it was time for Passover, um, people didn't just celebrate it in their hometowns. That's one that you had to go to Jerusalem for. So the city would have been packed. It would have been packed with people who were going there because of these festivals, people who knew their Bibles, who knew that, oh, only the Savior and King would be riding in on a donkey And so Jesus had everything set up. So when that question came, you know, who is this guy? Everyone would know, right? And and we know, and it's important for us to know this too, that this is Jesus, the king that was prophesied, right? Because I think sometimes it might have been easy for the people back then to sort of wonder and sort of think, you know, is he really the one? Because maybe there's someone else. Maybe it's, it's something different. And even for us, you know, there's times of doubt, and there are times of, you know, are all these stories, you know, really true? Are they all, you know, did Jesus really do all these things? And every once in a while, we get these parts of the Bible where we just can kind of sit back and look as Jesus shows exactly who he is. Yes, he's the king. Again, not, not the political king, uh, not like, you know, some sort of earthly president or prime minister sort of king, but the king overall. And he was doing exactly what God said he was going to do. And that's a good reminder for us, too. And it's also a good reminder for us, again, what, how different a king that Jesus was. Because if you think about it, remember that Jerusalem and and what we think of as the Holy Land, you know, Judea, it was called at this time, they didn't rule themselves at this point. They didn't have, like, their own government because they were ruled by the Romans. The Romans had sort of taken over them and, and made them a part of what we call the Roman Empire. And so, and that's why, you know, in a couple days when Jesus is on trial, it's going to be the Roman governor Pilate is, is one of the ones who does that because the Romans are in charge. Now, if you think about it, someone entering, you know, what had been traditionally the capital city of the nation of Israel or, or Judea um, and who everyone is proclaiming as king, that's almost like an act of war, um, you know, against the Romans, or it could be seen as that. Um, you know, you could imagine the Roman getting very nervous that everyone, oh, they're saying a new king is in town. And, and of course, that's exactly the way they accuse Jesus later. 
But note that Jesus didn't come in that way. Right? He could have, if he wanted to, I suppose. But he didn't come in with a big group of soldiers, you know, uh, showing their weapons and things like that. You know, that happens in a lot of countries where they'll have like a military parade, you know, to show how intimidating they are and, you know, the firepower they have. I found this picture of, uh, this is in North Korea, where they'd have this, this parade where they have, you know, these trucks with missiles on them, you know, and it's sort of to show everyone, don't mess with us, you know, because we're, we're strong like that. But Jesus doesn't come in that way. Uh, just like the prophecy said, that he'd be gentle and riding on a donkey. Um, again, Jesus could have had a legion of angels. You know, he could have really scared everybody and, and come in there with, you know, an angel army. But he comes in there quietly, gently, because he's not coming, of course, to fight an earthly battle or to stage a, a coup against the Romans. He's coming for something much bigger than that. And we see that with how the crowds react to him now. Um, wonderful verse here, verse 9. We hear that the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And so, you know, it's just neat to think about this. A, a donkey, I would imagine, and, we, you know, we didn't have someone... Um, who recorded for us exactly how fast Jesus was going. Probably not super fast. And so, you know, the, it's kind of walking slowly. So this is kind of a long, drawn-out thing. And it says that there's people behind him who keep following him. And there's people in front of him. And, and remember, the city is jammed because everyone's there for the festival. And so this, I mean, this would have gotten your attention. This, if you were a couple streets away, you know, walking around Jerusalem, you know, something's going on in the main road of town, and we're going to want to check this out. And not only that, but they are shouting these praises of him. You know, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We hear these things. And so the question is, did, did the crowd know what they were saying here? Because what they're saying is pretty clear about what they think of Jesus. This isn't just, Jesus, we think you're a neat teacher. And that's cool when you did miracles once in a while, so we're, we're happy to have you here. I mean, that was probably part of it. But the things they're saying, these are not things that would be mistaken for, for anything else than the only, you know, who Jesus could be. Uh, oh, we'll get to that in a second. But, but words like, Hosanna to the son of David. The son of David is kind of a loaded term. Um, because, yeah, King David was one of the very first kings of Israel, and, yeah, his, his line is, is what were the kings after that. But remember, there was no king right now because they were ruled by the Romans. So, again, calling someone a son of David was a way of saying, we think this guy is our king. And not only that, it was a term for the Savior. Because God had promised David that eventually you would have a son, God told David, you would have a son who would rule forever. Not just for, you know, an earthly reign, but for all eternity. And so son of David, that was saying, this is the Savior. Again, they're not whispering this, you know, behind people's backs anymore. They are shouting it, that this is the coming Savior. And then we have this whole business of, you know, the word Hosanna, and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And these were actually taken from uh, an Old Testament psalm. And again, the people would have known this. This was, this was a psalm commonly sung in the days leading up to the Passover? And, and listen to what this, some of the words of the psalm. Uh, Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. So just a couple of lines from it. And, and then again, we see that line, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Um, which again, wasn't just a uh, generic way to say, you know, say we're happy or something like that, it was talking specifically about the Savior. The one who comes in the name of the Lord, the coming one, that was the Savior who they knew was coming someday. But now, the way they're praising, that day was here. And then this whole business of save us, Lord. You know, it's just, it's interesting. Um, the original language back in the Old Testament of save us, Lord, uh, the word save us in the original language, um, it's, it's sort of pronounced, and I'm probably maybe not saying it 100% correct, is 
Hoshiana. Um, and, and those are the words that became, eventually, Hosanna. Right? So the word meant save us. Now it sort of became just kind of a word of praise. You know, like, like we might say, hurrah, or you know, some sort of thing like that. But at the same time, it was from this word that means save us. So here Jesus is coming in and they're saying, Hosanna, save us. You know, could there be a more appropriate thing, <coughs> excuse me, to shout at Jesus as he's walking in to save us? Now again, did the people get it? Did they understand what exactly he was coming to do? Maybe, maybe not. Were some of these same people the ones who didn't only shout, save us, but later also shouted, crucify him? Maybe. We're not sure. And same for us. Do we get it? You know, as we see Jesus coming in, do we realize this isn't just a story that we like to repeat every year? This isn't just one of those, oh, let's hear the one again. Tell me the one again about Jesus coming in with the, the palm branches. And, and it's true, it's neat. But do we get it? He's not coming to wage an earthly battle. He's, he's coming to fight sin, death, and hell for us. He's coming to wage war against the devil himself and that all the sins of the world, the sins of, again, the people shouting crucify him, the sins are sins that also needed to be paid for. Jesus came to do, to do just that. Right? We know who he is. We know he's the promised savior and he came to rescue us from our sins. With that question, who is this? We know the answer. We know that this is Jesus, the son of David, who came to save. He didn't just come to put on a show. He didn't come to do a couple of tricks and then head out. He came to pay for our sins. He came to die, right? And because he did, that gives us a lot of confidence because it gives us that confidence that, yeah, my sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. We don't have to worry about God saying, oh, Now's the time where I'm going to get you for those things you did. No, he already got Jesus. Jesus paid for it. Now, because of Jesus, because of what he did on that, that first Holy Week, because of his suffering, his death, and his resurrection, we know we have heaven. We don't have to wonder, you know, I wonder what happens when we die. God told us. Because of Jesus, what happens is we get eternal life by faith in him. What a gift that is. And it's because we know exactly what Jesus came to do on that first Holy Week. So again, when, when, when the crowds ask the question, you know, thank God, we already know the answer. You know, they ask it there at the end. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? You know, who is this guy that everyone's cheering for? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And thank God we know that this is Jesus and that he's more than a prophet, right? That he is the king of, who was promised the king who rules over everything, right? We know he's the son of David. We know he's the promised savior. And we know he came to save, right? So all we can do is follow him this week, follow his steps to the cross. All we can do is sort of, sort of shout, whether it's actually out loud or even just in our hearts of faith, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He came to save us. And that's exactly what he did. Amen. And I invite you then to please stand. And this time we'll confess our Christian faith in the triune God. And we'll do it using the words of the Nicene Creed. So I invite you to say these words along with me. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made.
We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. And we'll continue then with our responsive prayer of the church, uh, which again is on the screen behind me and in your worship folders. Uh, So we pray. Eternal Lord, give us peace as we ponder the good news that you forgive our sins in Christ. Lead us to see clearly the path you have laid out for us. Provide courage and compassion to all who preach and teach your word. Fill them with a love like yours as they proclaim your grace to us. to grasp the eternal value of keeping their children close to Jesus all their lives. Grant joy to those who are single and make them a blessing to others. Provide wisdom and insight to those who make laws and set policies. Give us respect for those who protect us from crime. Lead us to value the rights of our fellow citizens and to defend those who cannot defend themselves. Give us passion to share the story of your love with our family and friends. Overcome unbelief and open the hearts of people everywhere to believe the good news that Jesus has forgiven their sins and opened the gates of heaven. Extend your healing power to those who are sick and suffering in body or mind. Give patience and compassion to all who care for the sick and dying. Lift the eyes of the distressed and hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. Gracious God, You govern and direct all things, and you love all people. Hear our prayers, spoken and silent, and answer them in your wisdom and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll continue at this time with the offering. Uh, While the offering is being gathered, I invite you to fill out the Connect card that you find on each row, and those viewing us online can fill out the online Connect card also. Thanks.
Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who brought the gift of salvation to all people by his death on the tree of the cross, so that the devil who overcame us by a tree would in turn by a tree be overcome. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Lord God, you are worthy to receive thanks and praise from all people. You created the world and all who live in it, and in your mercy, you saved us. We give thanks to you for the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ. Though in very nature God, he took the nature of a servant and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. He offered himself as a sacrifice for sin and redeemed us from its curse and penalty. He rescued us from the terrors of death and restored eternal life with you. He conquered our enemies and gained for us the kingdom of grace and glory. Bless us as we receive your Son's body and blood and lead us to remember his suffering, death, and resurrection. Forgive our sins and fill us with the hope of new life in heaven. Hear our praise and receive our thanks as we worship you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
You may be seated. Uh, those will be coming to the Lord's table today. We invite you to come up at the direction of the ushers. Uh, we invite those who are connected to our congregation by church membership or by membership in another Wells or ELS congregation. Uh, and if that's not you, by all means, please talk to me and we'll talk about how we can have you join us here at the Lord's table as well. Uh, so come for all things have been prepared.
Please stand. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. And you may be seated. Once again, 
Good morning and welcome to Good Shepherd this morning. It's great to be with you to praise our God together and, and receive his gifts to us and his word and sacrament. So great to have you with us. And again, uh, glad to have with us those joining us online also. Um, special thanks to our, our fourth graders for opening the service for us and, and bringing that joyful song to, to get us started this morning. Very thankful for that. Um, announcements, we have a call meeting tonight at 6.30 p.m., and that is for uh, a teacher in our lower grades. We're specifically calling for a first grade teacher because we're, we're adjusting uh, some of where the teachers are, are, are teaching uh, for next year. Uh, but this is be, uh, from Becky Burr retiring, and uh, we're going to have someone else coming in because of that position. So that is tonight at 6.30 p.m. Um, so especially Good Shepherd members, we'd, we'd love to have you there for that. Um, and then this is Holy Week, as, as has been alluded to f- throughout the service. And so just to kind of run over the schedule again, um, if you just remember 4.30 and 7, that'll help you for the evening services. So we have uh, this week, Thursday, um, Holy Thursday, also known as Monday Thursday. That's this week, Thursday, 4.30 p.m. and 7 p.m. And then Good Friday worship uh, on Friday, of course, also 4.30 and 7 p.m., uh, so we'd love to have you join us for those. And, and please note, we're not doing um, Faith Night this week, so there's nothing on Wednesday this week. Um, just Thursday, Friday. Just. Just Thursday, Friday. Uh, and then uh, on Sunday, on Easter Sunday, we have our Easter sunrise worship, and that's beginning at 6.30 a.m. Uh, and then in between, and actually going from about 7.30 to 9.30, um, our Pioneers group has, has pretty traditionally uh, serve breakfast, so that's from 7:30 to 9:30. So, you know, it's not it's not just the window between the the sunrise and the you know eight o'clock service, but just so you realize, 7:30 to 9:30 is when that breakfast is being served. And then our Easter festival worship services are at 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. The normal service times, but those are both those are the same service. There isn't a, a traditional contemporary. Those they probably both be considered traditional um, for our Easter Sunday worship. So be aware of that for. Holy Week coming up, and uh, we hope to see you there. Um, you know, it, it's such a blessing to be able to follow Jesus, especially throughout these Holy, Holy Week services, including today. Um, and then we, you know, can't wait to see you by the empty tomb uh, on Sunday. So hope to see you at those services, but, but God's blessings on this week of yours ahead. And again, rejoice because we know exactly who the King is, who the Son of David is. Um, it's Jesus and because of him we rejoice. So thanks, and we'll see you again.